Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Sometimes even the best of intentions have unfortunate results. It was in 1892, one year after 11 Italians were lynched in New Orleans, that the whole idea of Columbus Day came into being. It didn't go into actually being a holiday until 1934. But in all those years, we've learned that this particular holiday hurts a lot of people. And that's been changed in a lot of places. And I'm delighted to be joined by council member Mitch O'Farrell from District 13. And here in Los Angeles, that whole idea of Columbus Day has changed for the last two years to Indigenous Peoples Day. Why was that important for you to put into place? Uh, well, glad to be here, Maria. Thank you so much. Um, when I was first elected to the Los Angeles City Council in 2013, um, I knew that it was important to have the support of my tribe, I'm a, of the Wyandotte Nation, uh, born and raised in Northeast Oklahoma, but I've been in Los Angeles my whole adult life. Uh, so I knew that my, my tribal identity was very important, just running for the seat. But then I get on the Los Angeles City Council and I learn that I'm the first uh, Native American belonging to uh, a federally recognized tribe to ever serve on the Los Angeles City Council. So uh, I willingly accept the responsibility of elevating the plight and the causes of indigenous and Native Americans here in Los Angeles. So in 2015, I introduced the initiative to replace Columbus Day from the city's administrative code with Indigenous Peoples Day. And after a two year struggle journey, uh, we were able to do that and adopt uh, the official law in 2017 and then celebrate it for the very first time in Los Angeles in 2018. It's important for a variety of reasons. Um, when the whole conversation nationally began with creating this Columbus Day holiday back in the late 1800s, as you mentioned, into 1934, was when the Native American uh, population was at its all-time low after three, 350, 400 years of genocide. Um, there were no Native American voices in the conversation whatsoever, no organizations that had any clout or standing. So it was in that backdrop that the Knights of Columbus were able to meet with congressional members, U.S. senators, presidents, and so in 1934 it became a federal holiday, Columbus Day, built on a false narrative. And so Native Americans in all the states didn't even have the right to vote fully in all of the states until the 1970s. So uh, that kind of gives you some backdrop. Um, and since then, really the 1970s is when uh, Native Americans uh, and indigenous folks started getting together saying, you know what, we'll celebrate our own holiday. Right. And they chose Columbus Day as the day. And that has gained steam to the point of in 1992, the city of Berkeley was the first town to make the change. And then since 1992, lots of cities have followed suit, but none as big as Los Angeles. So that's where I come to the picture. That's where we were the biggest population of any state or city up until that time to make the change. I knew it would have an effect across the nation or I felt it would. So sure enough, when we took the action, many large major cities followed uh, afterward and then uh, by last year, there were a dozen or so states and uh, over a hundred U.S. cities celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day, including the two cities uh, in the state of where I come from, Tulsa and Oklahoma City, has, have also followed suit now. So we were, we didn't start the curve, but we were ahead of the curve and we've had uh, great influence on the rest of the, the country with the action that we took. The reason I even brought it up at the very beginning is because I was surprised that the intent of Columbus Day was never supposed to be focused on Christopher Columbus. It was actually just marking a m moment in time in which American, as they knew it then, and I'm going to be very careful in the way I say it, America that you know started its journey, and there was this backlash against Italian immigration and uh, against Catholicism, and how things got skewed over the years and became a situation in which Christopher Columbus as an individual was being honored. And if you look into his history, there are so many atrocities, especially in regards to the indigenous people that you are referencing. Right. So. Christopher Columbus, like it or not, became the symbol. Right. Statues, 
monuments, major cities have been named in his honor. Right. And he himself, the historical record, is a fact. It reflects uh, the acts of violence uh, and really uh, murder that he was responsible for personally. And then his two subsequent trips subjugating an entire native population across the Americas, Central and South America. And this is a man that never stepped foot in the continental United States and never discovered really anything. Right. So this isn't about uh, the Italian culture or the Italian immigrant community or any particular heritage at all. It's about honoring the folks who are here before any of us to make it possible for us to live the life that we do in a way to honor First Peoples. And acknowledging and realizing their contributions, because you just mentioned the fact that you know you have the prestige of being um, the first Native American to serve on the um, uh, the council here in Los Angeles. But as a young man growing up, was that heritage part of your vernacular? Was that heritage part of what made you become you? Undoubtedly. Uh, so when I was very young, I. I learned that my grandfather had been chief of the tribe previously. By the time I was a teenager, my grandfather was chief of the Wyandots again. Uh, my mother was the Indian princess when she was 15, which is a great honor for one particular tribal uh, teenage female a year. And so my mother was the designation in, in the year she was 15 years old. My grandfather's brother was chief of the tribe. And then when Chief Billy Friend came out on two occasions, uh, to swear me into office uh, and participate in some of the Indigenous Peoples Day celebrations here, he's taught me that uh, Wyandotte chiefs run in my lineage. Uh, and I never knew beyond my grandfather and his brother. Mm -hmm. So I have to believe that somehow um, the journey, the, the destiny, whatever <laughs> we want to call it, uh, was laid out for me in advance in this very, very uh, circuitous route of me moving to Los Angeles at 21, not intending at all to go into public life, and then becoming the council member who would then help lead the way to create Indigenous Peoples Day. Right. Uh, so everything happens for a reason. I think the Wyandotte tribe in and of itself is fascinating because just, you know, kind of moving backwards and seeing how the adaptations and the um, complications and also the, you know, the gathering of, of different tribes to become the Wyandotte tribe, I thought was, is really, really rich and filled with so much texture. Yes. Uh, the Wyandots originated from the Lake Huron area, actually on the Canadian side of what is now the U.S.-Canada border, um, and dwelled in the Sandusky, Ohio area. At, we were nomadic at a certain point, ended up with, a, along with the Mohawks in New York. Uh, the Wyandots were the last tribe removed from east of the Mississippi River in 1843. Ended up in uh, what is now uh, Wyandotte County, Kansas, and then forcibly relocated to Indian Territory after that, which is where my grandfather was born and my mother was born and I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's quite a history, quite a journey. Uh, and we are of the Iroquoian sort of language and, and culture. So uh, it's a rich history. Native American hit history is a rich history that should be valued. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we all need to understand our origin stories a little better and recognize that all of us, no matter uh, what land we originally came from, human beings, we evolved from tribal units. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I hope that everyone can relate that to be Native American is also just to be human. And uh, we have a lot that we can learn from our Native American history. And celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day is certainly a way uh, to do that. Before we actually rolled cameras, we were talking about, um, you know, the climb to get to that point and how all of that has rather rapidly uh, sped up in terms of awareness and in terms of acceptance and in terms of uh, creating an energy around all of this for some very sad reasons, obviously, because of COVID and because of the social injustice that we have all witnessed recently. But it's also probably energized people's passion and, and verve to get mm -hmm. going with this mindset. The awareness of genocide, slavery, 
racial inequality, uh, it, structural inequities, just took a quantum leap forward after George Floyd, after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, and the whole Native American cause uh, is, is part of that zeitgeist. Now, we were able to remove the Columbus statue in 20, uh, 2018, mm -hmm. one year after uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. And that took heaven and earth as well. And that was on county property at uh, Grand Park. And that was a struggle, it was not easy, uh, but we were able to successfully remove that to think now that these statues are just coming down right and left, these symbols of oppression and genocide and hatred are coming down right and left is very interesting and comforting and it's great news, which is why I've introduced a resolution that will become a city ordinance on how to actually recognize historical figures, monuments uh, and honorifics across the city of Los Angeles so that we can deal with some of these uh, negative symbols of oppression that still exist in, in the city. There's a middle school named after Columbus in the Valley. So we have our work to do and we can have a conversation about it. We don't have to do what's been happening in other parts of the country and that is these statues are gonna fall one way or another. Right. I mean, look what happened to Monument, uh, out, um, Monument Boulevard in Richmond, Virginia. Um, they, they just the, the, the populations just are just starting to tear these statues down themselves because of what they represent. So we're gonna create an ordinance in the city on how to deal with how we honor historical figures or events in the past and present. Uh, so that's one of the outgrowths of this movement. And of course, we still strive to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day nationally. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually we'll get there, perhaps sooner than we thought. I'm curious uh, with this proposal about how statues, because a lot of times there's a misinterpretation about what the statue actually represented. So, you know, there has to be thoughtful process both in taking things down as well as putting things up. So how does one go about doing that? Is there going to be a historic research committee? Is there going to be, you know, a, a vote? How do you foresee that happening? We have the template. Um, we created the template with Indigenous Peoples Day. We'll definitely uh, form a working group. It'll be, it'll be made up of local native advocacy groups and anyone else who wants to join into the conversation. Um, and that will generate reports uh, from city departments uh, that will inform us, the elected officials, way forward on uh, creating an ordinance that will deal with proposals. It will deal with currently um, you know, negative celebrated figures um, that are recognized as, as, you know, symbols of oppression or hatred. Um, because destruction on its own is a negative thing as well. Well, it is. Well, we know that the, the statue of Hinapero Serra was torn down uh, unceremoniously in June um, because the Native American community has been working for years uh, with the Catholic Church um, on what Hinapero Serra himself represents to local Native American tribes. And uh, so that uh, was a bit of a wake up call for me to say, wait a second, that was on city property. We need, we need uh, an official way to deal with issues like this. And, and it's, it's a constructive way that folks can get involved in and it'll educate us even more on historical figures and their records and what they stand for. And it'll, it'll inform a way forward on how, how we can celebrate uh, the great uh, things that people in the past have done who've been completely ignored or are invisible. There are so many very apparent and obvious things, but there are subtle things within the city too. Are you focused on addressing those as well, the more hidden, mm -hmm. in, you know, hidden things? There is no doubt. We'll involve scholars and historians uh, and academics in this conversation, just like we did with Indigenous Peoples Day. There is no doubt in my mind that it will lead to information that a lot of people don't realize. And perhaps it'll lead to a way to honor the Tongva more because they were the, fo the folks that we've displaced um, you know, centuries ago uh, to build the lives that we're all now enjoying. Uh, there are a lot of ways that we can deal with that. So I don't wanna get ahead of things. Uh, I have a lot of streets in my head uh, and names of buildings that um, are named after folks who did things like hunt Native Americans 
for bounties. Uh, that'll all, ha all have to be dealt with. That's part of the reckoning. Um, because when we have these signal, uh, symbols rather, that uh, signify to the general public that, that we as a people hold them in high regard, imagine what that does to a Native American kid or a black kid or anyone else who has been othered in their lives or been marginalized in some way. It takes a psychological toll. There is a reason why one quarter, one fourth of the Native American community in the county of Los Angeles is clinically depressed. That's tragic. And that leads to a lifetime of underperforming and feeling undervalued, like you can't be part of something that the greater society shares in because you're told by the greater society that you are less than because we are celebrating this person who did something really bad to your people and, and uh, your minority group. So we have to deal with all of that. Symbols are important. Real change, real policy change is important. Reform, public safety reform, all important things. But symbolism is very important as well. Uh, and that can lead to a larger conversation about how we make society more fair and equitable for everyone. You celebrate diversity very loudly and very apparently, and you know, taking the concept of other and creating more of an us, but maintaining the value of the culture and the diversity. I mean, recently, I know that there's the whole gateway project with the Filipino community. Yes. What is all that going to look like, and, and how many of those are you aiming to adjust? Well, you can give public space greater purpose, greater reason, greater historical context. So the historic Filipino town gateway is something that my office has been working very closely with within the community, within uh, the groups in historic Filipino town, which I represent, uh, Commissioner Caloza, Public Works, you name it. And it's going to be a beautiful monument all of its own on the first street bridge there on Beverly, uh, at, at, I'm sorry, at Temple rather. Uh, and so that's gonna be a wonderful new addition. And it was curated very carefully through the Filipino community with uh, a call for artists and it was juried and everything else and uh, this wonderful, beautiful, new sort of symbol of what it means to be Filipino and to be in a historic area uh, that Filipinos helped build. Uh, we're doing the same thing over in a little Armenia with an Armenia, uh, Armenian gateway as well. And we're transforming areas that are either have been neglected or are somewhat invisible. In some areas, uh, some instances, areas that have been blighted, like in the case of the little Armenia gateway uh, marker, it's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna transform a blighted Caltrans parcel into this wonderful, his, uh, well, historic, but certainly cultural celebration of what it means to be Armenian in America. And so that's another one that we're doing. And, and yeah, I, I believe that we can, elevate what it means to be human in all of our diversity while elevating a public space at the same time. And what city can do that better than Los Angeles? We, we kind of owe it to ourselves uh, to give expression to that value that really what is what Los Angeles is all about. This is a question I, I don't even know if you can answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Have you been able to determine how many different substantive cultures are or that you represent in District 13? Well, I know this. In the 13th District, there are over 100 languages spoken. Oh, cool. There's indigenous languages from Central and South America and Mexico. Uh, there are other North American tribal languages spoken. Uh, there are you know, there's, you name it, there's a Mandarin and Cantonese, the list goes on and on and on, Bangladeshi, um, just over 100. So we have uh, in the 13th district at least 12 distinct cultural neighborhoods that are, are fairly uh, clear cut. One area that's shared, well, actually a couple of areas that are shared. Uh, we have uh, little Bangladesh that is co-located with Koreatown. We've got Thai Town, which is co-located with Little Armenia. So we have a lot of cultural representation in the 13th District and across the city. But the district I represent is probably the melting pot of it all.
And you've said yourself that enhancing those opportunities for people to enjoy is not just good for the citizens in the community, but it's also good for business. It's good for business. Tourism. It's good for cultural tourism. And I learned at a very young age that you come together over food. And when different cultures uh, get together and share food and break bread together, then you reach a deeper understanding and a deeper respect for folks and, and a celebration of folks who are of a different culture than you might be. Mm -hmm. Also, this I know that there are more partnerships that you're creating. Um, you have an interesting approach with the DWP and Native Americans. So, Maria, this is possibly one of the largest, I don't know, the, the biggest <laughs> environmental sort of improvement in, in the whole city of Los Angeles, if not the whole region, uh, that people will probably be talking about a few months from now. So uh, a little over a year ago, a couple of years ago, uh, my office leaned into the whole um, Department of Water and Power city uh, goals of getting off of coal entirely and going to 100% renewable. Around that time, the city ended its agreement with the Navajo Nation for their coal-fired plant, right? Okay. So when the city ended that agreement, the Navajos uh, just lost almost all of their income because coal is a dying energy source, as it should be. But the big question is, how do we get to renewables and not crash local economies and maybe help ratepayers in, in Los Angeles at the same time. So I invited uh, President uh, Nez from the Navajo Nation to my office with Marty Adams from the Department of Water and Power and his team. So I had two delegations in my office and we had a conversation about what will it take for the Navajo Nation to uh, transition into clean energy generation since we own the transmission lines all the way to eastern uh, Arizona and Northeast New Mexico, the Navajo Nation. What can we do to encourage and help you get go to solar so that we can enter into a new contract? Well, it's well on its way. Really? And the city could derive as much as 10% of all of our energy through this pending agreement. And so that's really big news. So not only are we helping Los Angeles ratepayers because the terms we're working out are favorable to ratepayers, and we have Angelino's interests in mind, but we're also giving a big assist to the Navajo Nation at the same time, which sadly is one of the populations anywhere in the U.S. that has been hardest hit by COVID-19. Mm. Uh, and so they're hurting. We're helping them go to renewables, which they'll have more customers after Los Angeles, after we do our agreement with them, they'll have more customers across the country. And again, Los Angeles is going to play a role in getting uh, someone off of coal generation and excavation to harvest coal into a clean energy source, cleaning up the environment there, here, and everywhere. So this could arguably be my very proudest achievement, quite frankly. Um, if Everyone has to be in the business of saving our environment because saving the environment means saving future generations. Those connections and garnering the trust and creating the relationship in which you could even move forward probably required some pretty heavy lifting because there's mistrust in, in the world no matter where you are. And so for you to reach out to the Navajo Nation, did they immediately pick up your call and say, sure, Mitch, we'll be down tomorrow? Well... In a word, yes. I, 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 they knew that I was of Native American heritage, so Which that helps. helped. We had the relationships. I've been building bridges uh, uh, wherever I can. Um, I go to the National League of Cities. I go to the, to the California League of Cities. Uh, we reach out to our congressional representatives, our U.S. senators, our state delegations on a variety of issues. And N Indigenous Peoples Day and Native American causes has been one of them. So we know the Navajos here in LA, and so the connection was pretty easy. Couple that with the determination and goal of getting off of coal and doing 100% renewable in Los Angeles within a decade and a half, we, need, we mean business. And so being a goal-oriented person myself and working with the DWP, and you know they have their orders as well, and having those relationships 
so that if someone says, hey, Mitch wants to have a meeting and getting a favorable response is important. So I've built my career in public service by building relationships as well uh, because that makes all of our work easier. It's, it's a person-to-person business. Politics means people. Uh, and so um, I think those are the factors that led to, you know, knock wood, a relatively easy pathway to hammer out some agreements to get us where we need to be. Do you have a potential timeline? I mean, I know that's kind of like saying, and you don't, that's an impossible question to answer as well, but do you have a hopeful timeline? Months, not really? years. Really? Months, not years. Yes. Even in the middle of a pandemic? Yes. Wow. Life has to go on. And uh, the, the planet is hurting. And so the sooner we can get this agreement going, understanding that the terms have to be satisfactory to all sides, then uh, the better. And uh, I'm motivated. Uh, and um, I think we're on our way. Congratulations. Well, congratulations will be in order once once the deal is done. All it, right, it, I take it, it back. I'm gonna, I'll hold on to you when you come it, back next In a time. matter of months, though. I, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic. It doesn't mean there won't be for, uh, additional hurdles. There are always hurdles to anything that is ambitious that you want to accomplish. Uh, but I am optimistic we will get there. All right, and I do have to also ask you, because um, you're a very strong supporter of the LBGTQ plus community. So, um, Good news in that realm. How are things going? Are you feeling confident that we're becoming more progressive in our, in our elimination of the word the other and including yeah. everyone in the us? Well, it's going to take a lot more work. Uh, we're definitely progressing, um, and you know we're 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 putting it out there. We're you know we're laying it down that we're building a society where everyone is welcome, where no one is going to be marginalized, where the structures of inequity and inequality are dismantled, not built up and strengthened, but dismantled. The upcoming election is going to be very important. Uh, there's about to be a, an epic Supreme Court fight. We know that the Supreme Court justices could begin taking rights away, not granting additional rights. So we have battles ahead, but the arc of life bends toward justice. I'm just hopeful that I can help pull the levers of government that I have the authority uh, to do so and the constitutional uh, authority to do so uh, to help everything move in the right forward momentum, the right direction. Uh, so yes, I have hope for the LGBTQ community uh, and especially in this zeitgeist, um, queer transgender women of color, uh, uh, black, the black transgender community, the black community, is it's time for us to really step up. And at the end of the day, we're all one tribe, one people. And let's recognize that, let's celebrate uh, our diversity and not exploit our differences because at the end of the day, they're very minor. And what are you going to do to celebrate indigenous people? I'm gonna to try to zoom into some classrooms if I can. I, I wanna just, I wanna talk about the importance of history and understanding um, the privileges that were granted us because of the sacrifices made by the First Peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we're working with, closely with the City, County, Native American, Indian Commission uh, on a virtual platform of celebrations that uh, uh, we all have in mind collectively. So stay tuned. We'll make sure and get the word out on what that is. There'll be performances again. You know, the first Indigenous Peoples Day at the steps of City Hall was historic. We had Red Bone, and we had the Black Eyed Peas and uh, other famous uh, entertainment uh, and, and musical groups. And we repeated that last year as well. So uh, we want to keep that celebration going. But we're going we're gonna to shift on IPD toward advocacy sure. uh, and while we celebrate what it is to be of indigenous and Native American heritage at the same time. Great. Well, mm -hmm. congratulations. And I'm sure your grandfather would be very proud of you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope so. We all live in the existence of our ancestors and the spirits speak to us. My grandfather, my mother, they're all very, very close to me and always will be. Um, and, you know, that's part of the legacy of being of Native American heritage as well. Great. Well, it was wonderful seeing you again. Thanks, Maria. You too. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.